Thanks for coming, everyone. Welcome to the last uh, cognitive seminar. I'm oh, sorry, cognitive seminar. Departmental seminar of the year. Uh, we saw up in uh, March. And it's a great pleasure to, to introduce our last speaker. I always like to underline before I introduce a grad student that you always intended that the uh, departmental seminar should involve grad students, especially late grad students who are close to finishing, like SARS. So, uh, you're in that situation and you would like to talk to the department, because you wouldn't really like to talk to the department, but you're a supervisor would like you to talk to the department and talk to me. We'd like to have you. <clears throat> um, yeah, so it is a pleasure to be Cyrus. He's been working with me for a few years now. He uh, grew up all over, around the world. I can't even remember where. Where did you grow up, Cyrus? Well, uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Ivory Coast, Japan. Yeah. Hard to remember the list. <laughs> um, he's got a... a, a BA degree, a bachelor degree from MIT in brain and cognitive sciences. And he worked for a while on the uh, internet search in the tech bubble days between uh, 1993 and 2001. Dropped by my office sometime in 2003 and said he wanted to go to grad school. We talked for a while and he came in. Got his uh, master's degree uh, after doing some very good work on computational co occurrence models of semantics a few years ago. He's published a few papers on that and some other computational work. So also got a few papers in press now about the stuff he's talking about today. Finished his candidacy exam a few months ago, and uh, the work he's talking about uh, today is related to uh, what he's going to do for his PhD. A few little facts that I guess many of you probably do know about Cyrus, but some of you may not know. Just the surprising little facts is that he speaks uh, very good Japanese, and his wife Kirsten, who's here today, runs Kirsten's Chocolates. On 112th Street downtown, buy your talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming to talk to us, Cyrus, and his talk is great. It's going to see a new perspective on language processing. Thanks a lot, Chris. And thank everybody for coming out today to the departmental seminar. I am honored to uh, be, I feel like grad student of recent memory to give one of these, but uh, any grad students out there will uh, we'll, we'll follow back my lead in the next uh, year or two and then do one of these. Very important. Um, before I begin my talk, I just wanted to uh, follow up on the Japan connection. Yes, I did live in Japan 12 years and I speak Japanese, and as you may have heard, there's been a big earthquake there. And so um, I'm officially going to start the way I've taken this $5 bill, and I'm going to put it in that uh, Red Cross box in the, in the general office here. We have a general office, uh, right? That's yeah. the supporting Sawa here, just put the box there. And uh, if everyone put five bucks in, which is like one coffee at Starbucks, right? Um, you could have one less coffee, but you could help uh, many, many, many people in Japan who are in trouble. So, um, if you have any questions about donating, Sawa's right here. She's one of our Japanese grad students in our department, and uh, she can tell you more about how to help. There'll be an event uh, April 9th? 11th. April 11th. Yeah. Uh, that you should all go to, too. A memorial event. So, anyway, uh, enough of that. Let's begin with the talk. Yeah? Thanks. My pleasure. You're actually good. Um, Today I'm going to be talking about uh, three, three studies that are part of my dissertation. And sort of, I think they're the easiest to understand, so I'll, I'm going to put them all in this talk. And I'm also going to be trying to talk about the rationale and the, and the sort of theoretical issues behind this whole uh, endeavor. Try to link it to a lot of what you guys do out there. I'm sure you, know, you may think that nothing to do with what you do or what you, your daily life routine, but I think this might have some connection to uh, a lot of general topics uh, around daily life. So. Uh, hopefully we'll find this interesting. Um, first, I want to thank mentors and collaborators. I'm not going to differentiate. All mentors are really collaborators, and all collaborators are really mentors. But you can sort of guess who's who. More than you, a little bit, you know, by the grouping. These are more mentor-like, let's put it that way. Um, uh, these are people are in the psychology department. These people are in the uh, wonderful Department of Linguistics here at the University of Alberta. Uh, Jacqueline is in uh, speech pathology. And uh, these are people outside of the University of Alberta who have worked closely with me. So thanks to all those people. Now, uh, every talk should, I think, begin with the question that the talk tries to answer or the research program tries to answer. So I'm going to put this in language that I hope will not confuse anybody at this point. Just trying to make it as uh, clear and, 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 and uh, easily digestible as possible. So here's a question. What is going on when we put two or more words together? And we do that every day, all day. We, we're constantly talking. We're, 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 we're a creature that likes to communicate, that likes to babble, that likes to use language. So you're doing this all today, all the time, but what, what's going on when you put these words together? If you just say one word, that's one thing. What if you put two words or three together? 
what's going on. So that's sort of the classic question of linguistics and psycholinguistics. Another one, what's going on when we hear or see two words, two or more words together? So you can say this is really too general. How are you even going to approach this? Or, you know, what, this has already been done a million times. Why are you even worrying about this? We know how to do this. We know what's going on. But I'm going to propose that we don't and that there might be other things going on besides what you already think is going on when you put words together or when you hear them together than you thought. So to get at this question, we have to think about what is this language faculty? This is sort of a word that's been bandied about lately. It's something that we have. It's a faculty like the you know, sight or maybe um, reasoning. We have a faculty of reason, and we have a faculty of language. I'm not sure if it's the best term. I'm not sure if it means the same thing to everybody, but let's just say that it's the ability of what we have to use language, all of us. So is it a specialized language domain-specific artifact? Is it using you know, brain networks that are just used for language and nothing else? Maybe they evolved, and we evolved the ability to speak and to understand language. So they had no brain region or no brain network that did that, and suddenly we have one. That's, that's sort of one aspect of it you can think about. And here are some people who have sort of directly or indirectly uh, impl implicated that kind of idea. We have modules, and maybe those modules are instantiated in the brain in a specific region or type of network in the brain. Now there's also people, and, and this is really not even a very complete list or a very representative list, but there's a lot of people out there who have talked about domain general types of cognition, navigation, um, sensory uh, and, and action type networks. And uh, these types of uh, general domain general people say that you know we, have, we had a lot of stuff we could do, a lot of stuff that other animals that are similar to us can do, and all you do is just create more, more, more brain area perhaps, or more complexity, but doing the same type of operations, and you can get from having no language to having language. So is the language faculty something special or something that's just a general purpose type of uh, faculty that's just been able to uh, take on language as a new challenge without changing any of its architecture? That, that's sort of one debate that is going to run through this whole talk. So if you could think about that as we move along, I think that could be interesting. Now what's language? Another tough question. Well, I'm just going to give a very simple definition. I think everyone would agree that it's when we put linguistic units together so that they make sense. And this is sort of like the putting the words together thing again. Putting them together and having that make sense, you're doing language. And so far, only human beings, homo sapiens, can do it. There you go. Now, what are these units that we use? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so, there's a phoneme, let's say, like the sound, uh, that's a phoneme, right? Then you could uh, make uh, syllables, which might have more than one sound, you know, un, ul, uh. uh. Those are all syllables, but they don't mean anything. I don't, think, I don't think those mean anything to anybody in English. Maybe in other languages. Now, uh, we have this other idea called a morpheme. A morpheme is, is a unit of meaning. Now, un is a syllable. It's also a morpheme. Like, uh, for example, this word has the morpheme un in it. So uh, that's a morpheme. But the word utter is also a morpheme, as are all the words that uh, have, you know, one, one unit, they can't be divided, they can't be cut in half, you can't split utter into ud and dir, that doesn't make any sense. So those are morphemes. Now, you can take words like utter, and uh, you know, you can say that's a monomorphemic word, and you can take other words and say they're multimorphemic words. And this one has uh, the word utter, and then you have a prefix on and a affix of elbow, and you get unutterable which is a word, it's in the dictionary. And you can mix and match morphemes and make lots of complex words in English. And uh, you can also make compound words, like underwear. Um, now we're gonna jump into another language here, Finnish, just for fun, and look at a Finnish uh, compound word. Thank you. We have a Finnish, I knew you were coming, so I threw it in for you, man. And I knew I couldn't pronounce it even close to that, so. And is, am I right that means railway station? Yeah, it means, yeah. And so if you break it down, the first part means iron, the second part means road, and the third part means station. So it's an iron road station. And so in Finnish, you can take three words and make compounds with three words. There are a lot of three-word compounds in Finnish, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot of five and even six words. Exactly. Now this one is for Kirsten, my wife. This is uh, one of the longest German compounds. But I'm not going to make you say it. I'm going to try <laughs> to say it. Einfleisch. 
Hauptstadt hier in Sürzüberwachung, South Gaben, Uber, Traug, Skats, I can't say it. Oh, I totally butchered that, but what that means is the Beef Labeling Supervision Duties Delegation Law. And it's a law, that's the law, if you go into the law books in Germany, it's actually longer because it's not actually just beef, it's beef and other meat products, so if you make it, it gets even longer. But um, that's a word in German. But in English, you wouldn't call it a word. So there's this issue that we're going to get into about language bias. Because people who study language until now, you know, the psycholinguistic community has been mostly English speakers, they've been thinking, okay, we got words, and we actually think about, you know, what a word is, and a word is a unit. And, but in other languages, what we think of, we think it would be a phrase or a sentence is actually a word. So that sort of throws into this unit question about what's, what a word is, uh, the granularity question. It depends on what language you're speaking. Yes? Do Germans see this as a word? Would they say that's a word, or would they say it's a phrase? I believe they say it's a word. Because in German, there are lots of words that are short too, right? And they write it this way. I mean, if you think of writing systems, these, this is no spaces in here, so it's sort of closed up without spaces. Then it's a word, right? There's no ambiguity. No, I don't think so. I mean, you have to ask a German speaker. I'm not a German speaker, but from what I know, that's a word. Now, um, as we move up, or, or yeah, increasing in length, in, in English, let's say, you have these things called engrams. And these are, these are what I study. Uh, this is a three-word engram, a uh, four-word engram, and a five-word engram. Now, there are issues here with the definition of engram. Some people want to say, well, shouldn't engram be idiomatic only or not idiomatic only or both? I think it should be both. Uh, there's a thing called compositionality. Should the meaning be cl clear from the composition of the individual word meanings? Or if they're non-compositional, they don't, you know, if they don't, uh, if the meaning isn't built from the word meanings, opaque, opacity, transparency of the meaning, those are some other issues. But I think anything's acceptable for an engram in my definition. You can have anything. It's also intonational phrase that, you know, could you say this as one outburst if someone was speaking, you know, if I, if I said, long way to, that would make, that'd be very strange, right? And you couldn't even think of any conversational context where you would ever say those words alone. But the red one is, could be, right? Like, uh, which one is broken? Oh, the red one is, right? But when you looked at it, it did seem sort of weird. It wasn't totally complete. And yet, when you say it in a certain tonation, it sounds complete. So there's a lot of you know, give and take with completeness and context that will make things seem more, more or less complete. And that's something that's interesting, I think. Now, engrams aren't necessarily sentences. But as you see, this sentence, fire, which is so you don't want to scream during your talks. Don't scream that during your talks, because then people run out of your talks. Um, that's a, that's, a, that, that's a sentence, really. It's a one-word sentence. There may be other one-word sentences. But it's also a word. It's also an engram. So you're seeing how everything sort of mixes. Nothing's one or the other. Well, this one is everything. It's an engram, it's a word, and it's a sentence. Same thing for this. And uh, I want candy. And the star is born. And this one, which we'll get into later. Um, so every, every five-word sentence is a five-gram in the way I see things. And every six word sentence is a six gram, but not all five grams are sentences. So here we go. Everything's sort of running together. Then you can have sentences come paragraphs, and paragraphs come together to make discourse, narrative, magazine articles, books, encyclopedias, whatever you want to go on. But, but those are just built up from these smaller units, right? So we're going all the way from this little sound all the way up to a full encyclopedia, and you can slice it any way you want. That's sort of the way what happens with language. Now, uh, talking about Finnish and stuff, there are these languages called the agglutinative language. And they have very high rates of affixes and many morphemes per word. Um, in Canada, we have a very uh, famous one, Inuktitut, which is spoken up in the very far north. It's uh, agglutinative. These languages are too. And um, for example, they have as many as 700 distinct suffixes in some dialects of that language, Inuktitut. So that's complex. And so, so you can put 700 different substances on any word and, and make them arbitrarily long, too. Not arbitrarily, but very long, so like in Finnish. So it's a very different way of thinking about language. When you think about it this way, you know, English seems a little bit poor in terms of what it can do. Um, and the words can contain complex concepts. So that's sort of the point of that. Um, now, many of you probably have heard of this uh, question of language acquisition. How do babies go from not knowing how to speak anything to being able to speak pretty well by the age of three? And uh, there was this long time debate started by Chomsky because he felt that there was a poverty of, of the stimulus. What he was talking about there is that children are able to produce things they've never heard. 
So how can they produce things they've never heard? Uh, they must be deducing some sort of rule, he said. And that there's not enough stimulus, not enough information, what they hear from their parents, to really get all the rules and to be able to learn language efficiently. So they must have innate language abilities. Basically, you're born with some grammatical knowledge, born with some sort of syntax, and uh, maybe sort of free, uh, less, less, less well defined, and then by the time you're three, that syntax that you're born with gets locked in, and then you speak that language. So that was a simple, simplistic way of talking about his argument there. There's more complicated notions there, but it's been challenged recently. And um, Chris Westbury introduced me to this uh, idea of the philosopher syndrome, which is that philosophers can mistake a failure of imagination for an insight into necessity. And so this sort of gets at, I think, the point that we're going to make about language acquisition too, which is that just because you couldn't imagine another way for children to acquire language doesn't mean that the way you thought of is the only way you can have it. Now, when children learn language, they start with these lexically specific representations. They'll learn, let's say, uh, mommy bye bye, right? They'll say that a lot. And they'll know that when they say it, the parents laugh, and that they, the, children, the parents nod say, yes, mommy's going out. And then they'll say mommy bye bye in the wrong context. And you know, so there's all these sorts of different um, sort of, if you've seen children, heard some children speak, they, they say these they say a bunch of words together. And if it, does the right thing, then they'll keep on saying it. But they're not good at segmenting words yet. So they'll hear things and they'll sort of take them as holes, and they won't know to split them apart and stuff like that. They'll use them wrong. And so they call these lexically specific representations that the children have. Now, as they get older, they seem to move to abstract, you know, and they get older, they, get, they, they seem to be moving towards using abstract syntax. And the idea is that, well, once you have the syntax, you can make complicated sentences and use all the rules of syntax in adulthood. What do you do with these? Well, forget them. You don't need them anymore. You've moved on. You've got great you know, language abilities. You don't need those anymore. But the question I have is, is it really sensible and necessary to jettison these, these, these representations? And that's sort of going to come into a lot of what we talk about along this talk. Now, one thing that I've thought about a lot is you know, nature gives us an environment we live in. There's grass outside, oxygen, trees. Or if you live in the desert, there's sand sand dunes, you know, depending on what your environment is, you will adapt to that and you will learn from that environment no matter what it is. And so I, I think also the language environment uh, can be thought of as, a, as, as the, the main teacher of language. People around us, what they say. And so um, there's this guy named Skinner, D.F. Skinner, and he really thought that language learning was compatible with behaviorism, which he, you know, been working a lot with rats and theories of, of conditioning. And so he wrote this book called Burrow Behavior, which I read. If anyone wants to criticize Skinner, I recommend reading Growth Behavior before you criticize the book. Because what happened was Chomsky, back in the 50s, didn't read the book, maybe read a couple of pages, and he just wrote this scathing criticism and said, um, there's no way that behavior can ever explain language. Language is beyond anything that can be explained through this kind of learning theory. And um, I think that really set things back for many, many years. But now I think Skinner would be very happy. If he's in his grave, he's laughing. Because uh, nowadays, people are using learning theories, behavioral models to explain language, as we'll talk about at the end of this talk. Another thing to talk about is non-words. Remember the WUG? I don't know if you ever heard about this thing, but you know, kids, if you say, uh, yes, watch the Bobby WUG Sally, what did he do? He just WUGged him. They'll, they'll, they'll do this kind of thing. And so WUG has no meaning, but to kids, all words start as non-words. That's one thing that you know we want to talk about. So they learn, they go, all the words they hear are non-words until they start understanding what they mean. And they do this with the context they hear. So the idea is that non-words in context develop meaning quickly. Like if I say to you guys, I love the wrong person, what does that mean? Did I love the wrong person? Did I hug the wrong person? You start guessing, right? Maybe because it sounds like hug and mug, you might think it might mean something like that. So already you're using just a tiny bit of information right here to guess what it means, right? Now, um, getting back to this sentence. This is uh, an interesting sentence, and, and uh, this was written about in a book by Noam Chomsky, Colorless Green Ideas Sleep Furiously. And uh, let's talk about the whole context of when he wrote this sentence. He actually wrote the second sentence right under it in his book, Furiously Sleep Ideas Green Colorless. And this is the exact text that he put under those two sentences. It's fair to assume that neither sentence one nor two, nor indeed any part of these sentences, now I added the emphasis here, he didn't have that, 
has ever occurred in an English discourse. Hence, in any statistical model for grammaticalness, these sentences will be ruled out on identical grounds as equally remote from English. Yet, one, though nonsensical, is grammatical, while two is not grammatical. And so this is uh, sort of coming back to this now and looking about all the stuff I've done. He said this with great confidence, but he didn't know that any of these parts of these sentences ever occurred or not in English discourse. And if I think about it now, green ideas. There's two words that go together a lot nowadays. You know, environmentally sound ideas are green ideas, right? Ideas sleep, and then they wake up. Who knows? I mean, the, the, the point is that, you know, he, he just assumed that this was something that would, the, even the parts of it, even the subparts would never occur, and that would never help anybody figure out what they mean, or never figure out if they're grammatical or not. But I think that was sort of a naive point of view. In that era, it was, it was conceivable that we'd never you know, have that possibility, but um, things are changing. People have a lot more information now to work with. Uh, Plato's problem, by the way, is the same sort of idea, like how do we understand things we've never heard before? And I think by looking at how often and how probable things are, we can, we can, we can figure out a lot of stuff that we didn't know before without any other information. Another little fun one. Has anyone heard this sentence before? Is it an English sentence? No? Does it look like a sentence? Does this make any sense to anybody? Does this mean something to somebody right now? Raise your hand if it means anything to you. Okay, well, you've seen it before. <laughs> um, the reason why people have seen it before know what it means is because um, you can analyze it. Buffalo, buffalo is a main clause subject, and then there's a subordinate clause direct object, and there's a subordinate clause verb, and main clause verb, and then there's a main clause direct object. So that's one way of analyzing the sentence, and it's sort of a standard syntactical, grammatical way of analyzing it. And if you rewrite it in this form, you have, you know, the buffalo from buffalo, who are buffaloed by buffalo from buffalo, <laughs> buffalo other buffalo from buffalo, right? And now it makes sort of sense. So I guess one of the goals I want to get is this meaning and this, this sentence, which has no meaning really easily unless you really think hard about it. How do you explain that? And what kind of models can you get at that will help understand why this one with the thes and the froms and the whos helps a lot and it's understood where this one is impenetrable in the beginning. Yet they mean the same thing. And with enough work you can understand they mean the same thing, right? So that's what I think these models will help us get to. And the idea that there's probability all the way down. And so this would explain a little bit about this probability or stimulus question. Because if you look at all these probabilities, there's a lot of information for children to pick up on. And uh, we can understand sentences that we've never encountered before because we have all the probabilities of the parts of the sentences. And uh, so we're hoping that these uh, questions can be addressed. But before we get there, oh, sorry. Uh, let me just explain. Whoa. Lost you. Hold a second. There you go. So. Uh, we have to talk about what probability is. Um, now there's raw frequency, we've all heard about word frequency. The word the is very frequent. The word, the word superfluous is very rare. So that tells you that the is different from superfluous. And all words that are as frequent as the are different from all the words that are frequent as superfluous, superfluous. And so you get a little bit of info from the raw frequency of a word, but not that much. What we're saying is that it's not the pure word probability that's going to get us where we want to go. What we want is a conditional type of probability. And this can become very complex. But the idea is that basically we need the contextual cues, we need the, the probability given some other thing. So for example, the probability of something meaning green in a certain way of meaning green, when you hear the grass was green, that's a certain probability. And when you hear the grass was green, the probability of being the color meaning of green goes way up and all the other meanings go down. So that's sort of the conditional probability, given context. Now the probability of uh, meaning of green changing when you say spend all my green, sort of a strange little engram. Maybe you've never heard it before, but you can sort of infer that they're talking about money, right? Because spending, you only spend money. So then suddenly the, the meaning here shifted more toward the money meaning of green, which is maybe not a common English meaning of the word green, but some people might use it that way. So. The idea is that we've got to have context and we've got to say these conditional probabilities or what 
are going to come together and add up to bring together all the different information we need to, to get at this kind of polysemy and shaded meanings of language. There's also an idea of prediction, that um, we have prediction memory, you know, we try to remember what happened last time we were in a situation and predict what's going to happen the next time we get in that same situation. It's a very useful thing to be able to predict. Uh, visual perception, you, know, you have illusions that are caused by your visual system trying to predict what's there. Uh, navigation, trying to predict where to go when we get lost. And, you know, when you add 4 plus 4, you have to predict what the answer will be. Now you say, oh, I know it's always 8, but you've developed after many years of practice predicting that the answer is 8. So the idea that language could be jumping off this general ability to predict and to have expectations about the future. And so what we think now is that using conditional probability within language stream and how informative those engrams are to build predictions. And that's, that's another idea that I think is built into this. The other thing is that when you have an unpredictable piece of language, something where the last word of a sentence makes no sense, it throws everything off. People react to it very differently than they would a normal sentence. So there's definitely something physiological that goes on when you break that predictability of language. So, Basically, my theoretical background here is information theory. This gives us the idea of entropy, of how much information is in a channel, how predictable is uh, the language stream. That's where we take some of our ideas from. Learning theory, we have uh, classical learning, Anderson, Newell, others talking about when you practice something, when you hear something over and over again and in different contexts, does that help you learn? Is that how quickly can you remember, how quickly do you forget things? That's sort of the general learning, and I think we can apply that to language. If we do, we get very interesting things. And then associate, associative memory, there are these guys with prior and Benton, and a lot of others who try to figure out how do we associate words when we hear them. Is it incidental association? So those are the kinds of theoretical things that I think you can bring to the table here to understand this stuff. Now, when we talk about engrams, we have four words, and we have these little connectors here. So this is a probability of word two given word one. And that's called the bigram frequency, two-word bigram frequency. And you have three of those. Now you have uh, this one, which is the probability of these four words occurring exactly in that order. And then you have the first three, that is these three occurring together, and these three occurring together. And so you have right here the whole gram frequency, uh, the bigrams one, two, and three and then the first and the second trigram. Now if you allow for skipping, you could say, okay, well there's another trigram which has these two, skips this one, it has that one. I'm not gonna draw all those, but yes, you could add all those too. If you add all those, you get a lot more. So um, this is one, one group of four words, but suddenly you've got, in terms of frequency numbers, many, like 10, 15 frequency numbers, just for that one item. So one question is what do we do with all that? And how does that make sense? I mean, if, if you know that you know this is very, very low, uh, bigram frequency, that can tell you something about what happens when you're reading this, because it's very unpredictable, right? It doesn't happen that often. So, um, Now, there's about four groups of people, well, I'll say three groups, Bannard, Matthews, and Matthews, Bannard. This group of people have done some research recently that sort of got this topic going. Um, they asked children to repeat, uh, someone would say to them a drink of milk, and all the three-year-olds would have to say back was a drink of milk. But how often did they make an error when they said it back? versus a drink of tea. Now, it turns out a drink of milk is a high frequency thing, both in their own production and what they hear. So they do that very well, but a drink of tea is low frequency, and they do a lot poor on that. And so that was sort of one idea that, well, maybe these children are really sensitive to the frequency of the, the whole thing, because the frequency of a drink of is the same, right? The same three words. Only changing the last word throws off the frequency of the four group, not of any other. So that is sort of one type of experiment that they started. And they did another one after that, and they, they held this frequency constant and they changed the slot entropy. That's how much entropy is there in that last fourth slot. And saw they had effects there. And also semantic density. Like if you put tea and milk are both semantically related, but you throw in a, another thing, like a drink of uh, I don't know, oil or something, something that's, that's not a, an edible food. You know, what does that do? Stuff like that. So they did two studies there. Then Arnold and Snyder, uh, they did this study. Instead of using children and repetition, they used adults and just reading words on a screen computer, they found similar effects. Uh, higher frequency foregrounds are read faster. And then our own uh, Antoine Tremblay and collaborators here at the University of Alberta did 
two, two, they published two papers that found a graph effect for self-paced reading, sentence recall, and ERP-based memory experiments using similar uh, stimuli. So sudden boost uh, in, in these types of uh, experiments, and that uh, something that, that interested me. I started working this back in 2007, 2008, so I was sort of catching up to them. And uh, now I'm, I'm doing my own experiments here that use the same similar stuff. Now this was a, a, a nice little diagram from uh, the 2008 paper. And what it shows is this is in uh, lots of child language. They had a database of child language. And so this dark black line is single word frequencies. And so um, T is pretty frequent. It's not the most frequent. This is the rank of the frequency here. So the most frequent word is up here, and then the least frequent word is here, and then this is the actual frequency. So first rank frequency word is very frequent, and then the last rank frequency word is, um, well, you can see there's this area under here where you have something like sit in your chair, which is more frequent than pet and win and desk. So there's a lot of these groupings of common words that they go together more often than that you even hear a single word. So that was sort of part of their justification saying, well, maybe because you're assuming that children are doing all the statistical and probabilistic thinking about language, if this is more probable than this, then you probably have a way of processing this as, as something on its own, because it's, it's very frequent. And this is assuming that they aren't you know, parsing these into words and not, not ignoring anything that's not you know, a word. They probably aren't. That's my point, is that they, they do can treat things more, that, that are more than one word as, as something that they should think about. So that's sort of where they started with this kind of stuff. And uh, so I sort of took some of these ideas and I applied these kinds of uh, similar stimuli with different paradigms. And I'm going to present three today. One is looking at subjective frequency, which is sort of like familiarity. Second a paradigm is a production where people actually have to complete n-grams. And then uh, the third uh, is a comprehension. So can people understand them, what they do when they, when they read them? So um, by doing these three types of experiments with three paradigms, I hope to give some evidence that I found a lot of n-gram sensitive behavior and how that will then link up with what I've spoken so far on the theoretical ideas. Um, before we get started, there's some statistical issues I have to deal with, and I don't want to delve into this too much because that will turn this into a stats lecture, which nobody wants. Um, but when you're dealing with these kinds of experiments, there are certain issues that you have to deal with. Um, one is the random effects of participant. In standard uh, statistical, you know, classical statistical, uh, even most usual psychological experiments, uh, when you do a, uh, a test on, on, on data, you treat your subjects or your participants as a fixed effect. But they're really not fixed effects. They're random. I mean, it's just if you do this, this ANOVA, uh, Linda, it's just if you do a ANOVA, like an F1, F2 cell ANOVA, you're really treating subjects as a fixed effect. And so to get around that, if you have a statistical method that can actually take uh, and deal with random effects per su on subjects, it's a very useful thing. And it removes a lot of variability that you wouldn't be able to remove otherwise. So that's one thing that I'd like to try to take advantage of. Uh, also items. And the, the thing is not just these two individually, but it's, it's both. In every experiment, you have, let's say, 10 subjects, and each subject has 100 items. And so the items are random. The effects of items per subject is random. The effects of subject per item is random. So you have crossed random effects. That's, that's the tricky part. How do you deal with crossed random effects from subject and item? And so I have to use certain physical techniques to deal with that. The other thing is that there are often autocorrelation between trials, temporal dependencies. Now, one of the uh, assumptions of standard statistics is that your observations are independent. So if you ignore temporal dependencies and just say they don't exist, and you analyze your data under the assumption that your observations are independent, when they're actually dependent on each other, that can cause problems. And I'll show you one analysis at the end where I do uh, deal with this, this issue, and I'll show you how big a difference it makes. Um, there's also uh, an issue of collinearity between predictors. Whenever you do multiple uh, regressions, if your predictors are extremely highly correlated, there, there are problems that arise, so we have to deal with that too. And so here are some of the methods I'll be using. Uh, just name them. We have linear mixed effects models. Linear mixed effects models dealing with the first of two points. You can explore the autocorrelational structure and control using uh, certain techniques we'll explain in a minute. And then there's some 
dimension reduction techniques, I'll only be talking about B today, but the other ones are also interesting. And then also, uh, for inference, we'll be using some model comparison. So, subjective frequency. Um, in uh, word research, when people rate uh, words and how familiar they are, that familiarity rating has been shown, shown to be very predictive. So, um, my question was, what about an n-gram familiarity? Would that also be predictive? And that would sort of tie into this idea that n-grams are like words in many ways. Um, but they're also uh, correlated with objective frequency. So if you say something familiar, usually it's also very frequent in a corpus. So let's uh, see if that's true for n-grams. I uh, collected some ratings, and uh, 150 group, main groups of 150 undergrads uh, rated 120 n-grams each. And then we uh, looked at that. This is the uh, survey. You know, you have two grams, three grams, and you just have to decide if you are there. You don't, you've never used them or read them, or you use them and read them very often. So did a lot of that, and uh, we checked inter greater variability to make sure that it wasn't all over the place, and it's pretty good. Um, they also we threw in zero frequency and grams to distractors see if they were paying attention, and they rated those as, as very low. So that, that's good. So first, let's look at subjective versus objective frequency. There was some evidence that uh, they should be correlated. And so here are uh, the correlations for two grams, three grams, four grams, and five grams. And uh, we have some uh, bootstrapped uh, confidence intervals around the correlations. And they all have nice, uh, they fall within their confidence intervals. And then you can visually inspect them and say they look like they're correlated. So here we have a nice uh, case of the uh, n-grams working like the words and, and being correlated with the familiarity their frequencies. Also, uh, if you split, take all two, three, four, and five grams, put them together, and then split them uh, in the ratings. So seven was the highest rating. So anything that's rated between four and 6.5, these are the uh, ones that got the highest ratings of familiarity. They had also the highest correlation. Second highest correlation was the middle group. Uh, so rating between three and 4.5. You can see the slope of the line is a little bit flatter. And then, the uh, lowest ratings from 1 to 3.5, there was, uh, as you can see, the common interval contains zero, doesn't, doesn't really have a correlation. And this actually mirrored the word research that other people had done. So like that, the higher you rate them, the stronger the correlation with their frequency. <coughs> now we had another uh, task we did in this uh, work with subjective familiarity. We did uh, the ratio of frequencies, seeing if you had two of them, and you just have to show which one was more frequent, which one was more familiar, could you do it? And would that choice be affected by the objective frequency, how often it appears in the corpus, how probable it is? And so uh, before we did n-gram, we decided to start with words, unigrams, to see if uh, they would do this with words. Because if they don't do it with words, then they definitely won't do it with, with n-grams. But let's just see what happens with words. Um, now, we're going to use linear mixed effects models here uh, to model accuracy from this package, LME4. And uh, because it's a binomial dependent variable, either yes or no, right or wrong, we can't use standard. We have to use log logistic style regression, so we're using uh, the generalized linear model here. The task is, uh, you see this on the screen, after you fixate, which one is more familiar, which one has a higher subjective frequency. Now, probably here, you guys would say that's hard. Mm -hmm. I don't I have no idea which one is, I'm, I'm, I'm from one. well, maybe tooth, right? Who knows why you pick tooth? And it turns out the tooth is more frequent in the corpus too, right? But there's no overt knowledge of how to do this task. People just guess which one is uh, more, more familiar to them, more frequent. Now the stimuli um, were distributed in a very nice way for me. This, this upper triangle here basically says that each of these dots is one of the word pairs, and uh, some of them were, the first word was more frequent than the second word. Some smaller, but you get full coverage of all the possible uh, types of, of, of frequency ratios, from the first word being very frequent, the other one being not frequent, to both having almost equal frequency along this line here. So we had a nice spread. And then this was the uh, accuracy. So again, each of these dots is an item. And so uh, as uh, your accuracy goes up, so does the ratio of the frequency. So if they're farther apart, if they have a bigger ratio, like one's 10 times more frequent than the other in the corpus, then you're at this very high accuracy rate, very high agreement with what the subject said. On the other hand, if things are low, then uh, 
they, they get below 50% accuracy on those because they're just very, very close together. This is like, you know, 1.3 1, 1 times more frequent. So it's very hard to tell those apart. Now this is a strange kind of distribution. It's, it's, it's um, the, as you go up in this x-axis, the uh, distribution of the residuals is not normal. And so really you shouldn't be doing uh, correlations on this. So just thinking of Pete Hurd, I, I, I use Kendall's tau and then I bootstrap Kendall's tau. And I mean, you get the same result as you would using R and other stuff like that, but um, using uh, Kendall's tau seems a little bit better at this point. Now, uh, for the single words, this is what happens when you do a linear mix effects model. You get this kind of stuff. Uh, I feel like I'm going over time, so I'm going to. I'm going to minutes and thirty seconds. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, skip over the definition. We've got more I want to explain later, but I'm just going to interpret this as saying that uh, my model that had ratio, the ratio of the frequency and position, did very well, and uh, the interaction wasn't necessary. But I'll, I'll explain this stuff more as we go along. Uh, reaction time, nice uh, decreasing relationship. That is that the uh, as the as the, the, the ratio, the, the number of times more frequently they are, the faster you can make that decision. So that's a that's a nice uh, effect too. It makes sense in, in our model that you can process these faster and process familiarity faster. And this is the reaction time model. Again, uh, word frequencies and length. Uh, had the, you know, excuse me, work frequencies in length, but the best one I think was, uh, oh no, yeah, this one is simpler, so it, uh, it wins, even though it has similar uh, fit penalized for the number of parameters, uh, less degrees of freedom, so we picked this one. Now, we did the same thing with uh, two, three, four, and five grams, except this time instead of tooth and alert, you have metric tons and inner workings, different types of stimuli. And here, those are 2.3 times uh, different in, in their frequency. That is, metric tons is 2.3 times more frequent than inner workings. So will people pick this one over this one? Um, so here's some more sample stimuli for three grams. These two could be compared. Now, these two are actually very different. 41.8 times more frequent, and that's for long curly hair. That's 48.1 times more frequent than dubious scientific value. Uh, same here. <laughs> This one's 10 times more frequent. And uh, here's one that's almost the same frequency. It's only 0.8 times more frequent. So this is a real challenging one. We'll be able to, to, to decide which one's more familiar. Uh, the first step in the versus and can be used for. Same kind of stimulus presentation. Um, and uh, same kind of coverage over all the possible ratios of frequencies. Now this one's a weaker correlation. This is all the 2, 3, 4, and 5 put together. Still significant, or you know, still believable, but uh, not a strong correlation. And again, you have the same problem of heteroscedisticity that you you know don't want to really do correlations on this. But when you do a linear mix effect model, you get these really nice uh, effects. So this is uh, a trial level model of uh, familiarity judgments. As the frequency ratio between the two n-grams goes up, the accuracy goes way up, and it crosses the chance line right around there. And then uh, as the number of words increases, the accuracy goes down. So the people are really good at this for two grams, three grams, four grams. Well, four grams are getting worse than five grams. Not so good anymore. So maybe there's a length effect there. And uh, we did another generalized linear mean effects model. And the best model um, was this one, which had added effects of ratio and the gram size. This one, which had interactive effect, was Again, not significantly different from that model and its fit, so we went with model three right there. Um, these were the uh, fixed effects, and again, the frequency ratio of the n-grams and the size were the two that remained, and they were uh, strong predictors. Although the frequency ratio was a bit stronger than the n-gram size. So subjective uh, corpus frequency looks like it, it does uh, help us a lot. You can measure it on absolute scales, you know, absolutely on a scale of zero to seven, how frequent is this, and people, what people know or is, is actually close to what's in the corpus. And then uh, the relative one also works. People, at least for two and three grams and maybe even four grams, they can tell uh, implicitly 
from their internal knowledge of, of the probabilities which ones are more frequent. And these were not obvious, so that's pretty astounding to me. Now the production tasks, I, I, some of you may have seen this before, but I got people to fill in letters, the first letter of a word. There's a lot of uh, possible ones. Uh, filling, willing, over there, uh, eat, I mean, uh, let's see, beat, meet, there, uh, keep. You gotta put one letter. So the idea was that what letter would people fill in to complete these? And would those letters that they chose give different engrams of different frequencies? So I'll quickly go through this because I'm sort of running short on time. I want to get to the third paradigm. Um, this was also uh, similar but with words instead of letters. If you look at the uh, relationship between the family size, uh, the server responses, how many choices, how many how many answers did they give out of, you know, let's say one, one, one answer, two answers, three answers, how many kinds of answers were there? And how many kinds of engrams were there in the corpus? Nice relationship there. So the more answers there were in the corpus, the more uh, types of answers they gave on the survey. And this is the same for the uh, words uh, as well as the letters. And then here's sort of the uh, answers to one, one of these, like this should be nothing to do with the, or anything to do with the, they have to put, put a word in there. So in the corpus, this uh, green one is the corpus, and it's sort of sorted by corpus uh, order here, that's why this is a descending line. In the corpus, nothing was the most frequent. Anything was not exactly this frequency, so it sort of jumps around. But you can see in general there's a pretty strong correlation between the corpus ones. Like, uh, what isn't way out here? So you know that there's a general sort of connection between the corpus frequency and the number of times people chose that word. And again, it's the same, nothing to do with or blank to do with the, you can see that the uh, rank frequency of the response on the survey was very highly correlated with the rank frequency of that engram in the corpus. And then here's the analysis showing that those correlations for, for all the items in the survey except for these three in the letter task, and those correlations were strong for most of the items in the word one except for those three. I'm not sure why. This could be something to do with the, on the internet. There's a lot of music sites that talk about the worst album of all time or something, so that one jumped out as being not very strongly related. But most of them really had nice production connections. So, uh, summary of those results, family size rank in the corpus was related to family size rank in the survey responses, and um, the rank correlations were liable for most of our stimuli. So that sort of pointed out that, you know, people, they're producing things, they're choosing words, choosing letters, they're choosing them perhaps based on the probability distribution of the engrams in a corpus, which is reflected in their knowledge. Um, and familiarity, seems to be affecting word choice in this unconstrained task. Now, this is my newest study, and this is the new data that I wanted to get to today. So I'm gonna, I'm sorry I have to rush to here, but I've been just completing an experiment uh, with uh, Georgie Columbus and Harold Bynum in linguistics on the comprehension of engrams, and it was an eye movement study, my first. So um, I asked 19 subjects to read 1,000 three grams. It took them about an hour and 40 minutes. Some people who were not English native speakers took them two hours or longer, so it's, it's hard. Makes your head hurt. Um, makes your eyes hurt too. And um, the interesting thing about this is that the three grams cover the whole range of frequencies on all the n-gram sales simultaneously. This is part of the idea that we didn't want to just say, okay, here's frequent and infrequent, or frequent word first, infrequent word first. We wanted all the possible uh, sort of points in that uh, area, and that would allow us to have a completely correlational design. And we'll see what, if that worked out later, but. First, this is the stimuli you see on your screen in the eye tracker. You see a three-word engram, and you were told to just read it as quickly and accurately as possible. There was a, a meaning task that was thrown in, so people couldn't just scan it and, and forget about it. They actually had to process it, because they were asked at random 50 times out of 1,000, make a sentence using that. So they, they really had to be on their toes to really process the meaning. Now in eye track, what happens is you get a fixation, which is where their eyes stop for a short amount of time, and then they saccade to another point, they fixate there, and then they can regress, which means they saccade backwards to some place before, before where they just were, and they can take some information up in there, and then they can saccade to another place, and then what we had is this purple box here is, a, is, a, is an invisible box that was on the screen. As soon as their eyes crossed this line and they fixated somewhere in this box or beyond it, we knew that they were done reading, so we wiped this and uh, give a new fixation point right here where that letter L is. 
preparing them for the next trial. And then once they were fixated on that fixation point, then we show them the next words. So it's like a visual cue for turning pages, but you don't have to use mouse buttons or joysticks or foot pedals. You just move your eyes and you get a new stimulus. And that's really a natural way to do this quickly and easily, because your eyes are, are used to moving to the end of the page when you want to see if there's something else coming up, you just move your eyes over. So that was what we did, and it worked out very well. The other thing that, um, there's lots of stuff we can analyze here. I've only sort of touched the tip of the iceberg, but if you just see how many times they fixated before they jumped out, you get these four numbers in milliseconds, and you add them up and you say, okay, well this three gram took 673 milliseconds in total fixation. So that we're gonna, we're gonna use that as our dependent measure uh, in this analysis. Now this is sort of crazy looking, but what it, it is, is all the predictors that I'm gonna put into the model. Um, we have the whole n-gram frequency, three word frequencies, three bigram frequencies, including the split bigram. This is the first word and the third word, ignoring the second word, what's the probability of those occurring together? And then you have the length in letters and spaces. So if there's lots of long words, you know, it could be like 25 letters combined plus the two spaces. And then this one is um, a rating we got from uh, people we, we asked in the community, rate if these are complete or not. Remember I, I was talking about, you know, can you say it in one breath in a conversation or not? So they rate it on completeness and we have that mean rating. And um, what these numbers are is based on the size of the font, how correlated they are. So little tiny ones mean really no correlation. Big ones, like 0.5, means that uh, BF2, B2F, and W2F, so the second word frequency and the second bigram frequency, strong correlate. It makes sense, right? Second word's frequent, so the second bigram is probably off be frequent too. But these, lots of these big numbers, I mean, when you're talking about thousands of, of uh, observations, 0.33 is, is significant, very, very significant. I mean, correlations go way up when you have that kind of data. So um, this is a problem if you're worried about multicollinearity. They're just all intercorrelated. Um, and so we're going to try to solve that problem later. Now another thing that we can do to check here is uh, the temporal interdependency. So this is a autocorrelation for each subject. Subject here, and this, this first line is, is with the, the trial that you're talking about, and then the next second line is the trial before it. So is the time it, uh, it takes them to read uh, these three words related to the time it took them to read the three words they just read in the previous trial? And it is, and it goes all the way up to 30 trials back. So this is sort of mysterious. I am sort of guessing that there's a strategy difference because these people down here, like this person, this person, there's no autocorrelation. The one that they read 10 times ago isn't affecting what they're reading right now. But this person, this person, this person, this person, this person, they have these massive whopping uh, temporal effects. And the thing that's interesting is that if you leave those in and, then, and just let the model uh, go without pointing out to the model that there's also this correlation, it can give you much, much less interesting models. So we're going to try to deal with this uh, autocorrelation. <coughs> Uh, in our models that we use for this. So uh, I'm going to call this the base model, which is all the stuff that um, I talked about. These uh, XFQ1 is the first words frequency within the experiment itself, not in the corpus. So that, that also came out before we, we, we removed some variables. Anger frequency is our variable of interest. And then we have trial number here. And look at that whopping um, T value. So very, very strong. Uh, practice effect. What that means is that as they went through the experiment from trial zero to trial thousand, very negative slope means that they got faster and faster and faster. So they learned, they practiced, they got better at the task. But now we've removed that variability due to trial number. So anything else left over isn't going to be related to that practice effect, which is really great. Um, also, the previous RT, this is where I shift the reaction time back one slot. So you say, okay, have the reaction time, response time for this one to read those three words and then the one before it and we take out any effect from that one. And that's a big positive one, so it slows you down. If you did um, fast on one, it'll slow you down the next time. But we also remove all that previous RT effects. And so uh, with temporal dependencies taken care of, we still have a nice negative n-gram effect that you get faster as the n-gram you're reading is a more frequent n-gram, which is what we expected, and so it's in the right direction. And these are the random effects here. And then if you do model comparisons, you have the base model that I showed you before, when we add trial, we get a real big improvement. This means big improvement. Um, <laughs> if you add uh, previous total fixation time too, you get another big improvement. And then, remember I showed you in that autocorrelation, some people were showing this autocorrelation, some people weren't. Well, we can deal with that too in these linear mixed effects models. We can say, make the effect of the previous trial, make that correlation, make that slope different depending on the subject. Some can have a higher slope, some can have a lower slope. And so when you throw that in, it gets even better. So definitely it was, it was important to find their correlation and make sure you knew that it was dependent on the subject. 
So that's this model three right here. And then when you add finally n-gram frequency to that model, it explains a little more variability. And so we get a little, uh, we, we can see that this n-gram frequency does really, be an, and it's a very important factor in explaining why people take so long to read these three grams on the screen. Now, multicollinearity, I'm going to skip this because I don't have time to talk about it, and you can ask me later, but it's really more of a technical point. Uh, just say the condition number was 69, which is a very high condition number in the, in the first uh, data we saw. Use principal component analysis, and uh, after we apply that, it uh, makes everything orthogonal. Now, condition number down to 15, so we're good. We've got in our model the angular frequency again. These encapsulate everything else. We still leave trial and the previous trial out. And those are slightly correlated, but um, not, not enough to throw anything off. Point here is that after you put the principal components in, you get the similar patterns, still negative, still very strong. So it really didn't matter in the end, but it's good to know that if there had been any problems with multicollinearity, this would have dealt with. Um, again, model comparison showing that uh, when you add n-gram frequency to the model that doesn't have n-gram frequency, you get a nice big improvement. And then uh, to see if these are really uh, reliable, you can also look at the highest posterior density, which is sort of like a Bayesian uh, confidence interval. And again, the important one is that for n-gram frequency, this interval here does not contain zero, so we're pretty confident that n-gram frequency's uh, slope estimate is, 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 is valid. So the summary of these results uh, from the eye tracking experiment. After controlling for all this stuff, and gram frequencies contributed a lot to, to the predictability of people's reading time. And uh, multiplanarity didn't change the outcome. And uh, so a had a high probability of being read faster across a broad spectrum of frequency bands. So that, that's the real power of the experiment, that we're covering stuff that's super infrequent to super frequent and everything in between on all the dimensions. So if it can handle that, then it really means that at all points in the spectrum, n-gram frequency makes, makes a difference. So um, am I over time yet? Or am I over time? I'm over time. OK, I'm just going to wrap up. Uh, apologies to uh, some rock and roll bands from LA, glam rock bands that we saw remain unmentioned. But where do we go now? I think uh, we've entered the large data age. And that's something that's going to change the way we do psycholinguistics. And I'm sort of interested in being on the cutting edge and using enormous databases and uh, enormous amounts of computation that we're able to do things we could never do before. So I think that's fascinating. Um, new ways of approaching both questions, new ways of modeling language are now available to us. And I think there's some radical ideas and they have a place at the table. There's also new measures. People are starting to use uh, family entropy, slot entropy, mutual information, information content, conditional frequency, surprisal. These are all combinations of frequency formation and other ways of, of using, using more, more than just the raw frequency or even the conditional frequency, but other more advanced measures to, to, to measure things and to understand what's going on. I think those are going to be very important in the future. Um, first of all, is there a mental lexicon? And if, it, if there is one, does it have any words? I think a lot of uh, the ways we're thinking about language now sort of call into question that. It's sort of radical to say that we, there is no mental lexicon and there are no words in our heads. But when you think about things the way Elman does, and here's a quote from him if you want to read it, I think uh, he's got a point. I think there is a, a way, another way to think about language that doesn't require a mental lexicon. And maybe the concept is getting in our way. Um, other things, linguistic rules, the Chomskyan style, uh, grammatical rules, they explain a lot of stuff. They're good explanatory devices. They're descriptions of language, but they don't explain what we do when we process, I think, and they sort of get in the way sometimes. So there's so many exceptions, and I think probabilistic models are very parsimonious, and uh, they can explain more about behavior. So I think those kinds of models are going to be uh, in the future. I'm just going to talk about this uh, new model that's coming out, which sort of embodies everything we talked about, the Night Discriminant Breeder by uh, our own Harold Byan and uh, others in this room who've worked on it. Um, it uses the standard learning equation of the squirrel wagner model. So anyone who does animal behavior, you've heard of the squirrel wagner equations, and uh, uses them to learn about language using text as input. There's no representations that correspond to whole words, whole phrases, or anything. Um, just letter units, letters and letter bigrams, and it observes regularities. So I've stolen this from Harold's webpage, but <laughs> it gives you the idea. In traditional uh, models or networks or these kinds of things, you'd uh, 
have something like the form of the word in letters or sounds. It would feed into some morphological layer. Uh, so these will activate win and er, which is a suffix. And then those two morphemes, when activated, get you to the meaning of that, which is winner. This uh, all caps is, uh, is it signifies the conceptual instantiation or the uh, meaning instantiation. Now, with the naive discriminative reader and other types of amorphous uh, models, discriminative models, you go straight from form, letters, to semantics. And these equations sort of get you there. These are all probabilistic transitions. So you have all the probabilities for all the letters and how they map onto the meanings. This is the meaning of agency, right? Something, someone who does something. So it's a very simple model, but it does way better at many things than other models. So last slide, and I'm sorry for going over. Um, we've given some evidence for engram level phenomena, given some support for the relevance of these sub-sentence uh, structures for language processing, and we've talked about how probabilistic information is a main input to these cutting edge models of language and meaning, and so they're very important. Thanks for your time. Yes, no. Uh, well, I was just curious. Why does uh, and why does the uh, distance effect disappear when n grams hit three or four? Yeah, I think that was your first experiment. Uh, four or five. Four or five. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, two and three are pretty strong. Four is sort of borderline, and five it seems that people are almost a chance. And I think it, it, it has, it's a very deep point that maybe there's some limitations to the way we do language that really don't let us store a lot of uh, implicit subjective information or even objective information about frequency for long, long, long things, for word things. But maybe two and three is, is the right size for us to process and we can keep track of that stuff. So it may be something along those lines. Well then I would turn it around and say, what do you have any of the four and five? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, maybe the items I have to, you know, maybe expand to see if it's it's really the items I picked. I mean, these are still, you know, first second time doing these experiments, so we don't know if, it, if what, what's driving it. But um, it could be just weaker, and, and only uh, it depends on something other properties of the items of the of the inverters. Any other questions? Definition, the German example. Do you expect to see the those speakers reacting the same way to the engrams as English speakers? So would they have be more sensitive to engrams that are six, seven, or eight if they're more used to it? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I can speculate from what I, I've learned that they, they may they may be be since since they have these longer stuck together groupings uh, that they have to learn to learn their language. They may have improved that skill. Of, of, of holding, you know, lots of, of things in, in their head while they're reading words and building them into, into bigger meaning. So it is possible that they're better. I'd like to find that out. We're out of time. Thanks a lot, Cyrus. Donate if you can. I'm going to give my salary. Here you go. Thanks.